The one thing that people don't know, actually two things that are horrifying, that if you are blessed to live to 85 or older, you have a one in two chance of having dementia or having lost your mind. And so, and the other horrifying um, fact is Alzheimer's disease starts in your brain decades before you have any symptoms. So for example, I diagnosed a woman who was 59 with Alzheimer's disease. Odds are she had negative changes in her 20s. So, so many uh -huh. people never think about their brain until they're 60, 70, 80, and they start dropping words. When that's not early, that that in fact can be late. So we need to have a campaign to get kids to love their brain, to get teenagers to love their brain, to get young adults, young mothers to love their brains. Uh, it's just so critical. And the reason to do it when you're in your 20s is your happiness will be better if your brain is better. Mm. Your relationships will be better if your brain is better. So I have a high school course called Brain Thrive by 25. And we studied it in 16 schools. Decreases drug, alcohol, and tobacco use, decreases depression, and improves self-esteem. And we start with this really simple fact. Your brain is involved in everything you do. How you think, how you feel, how you act, how you get along with other people. Your brain, the physical functioning of your brain is involved with every decision that you make. It's the organ of loving, learning, and behaving. And when it works right, you tend to work right. Mm -hmm. School is easier. Relationships are easier. Having a sense of direction, purpose, all of that is easier when it doesn't work right for whatever reason. Um, you had mold in your home. You have post-COVID, which is very common these days. You had a head injury playing mm -hmm. soccer. Um, you're sadder, sicker, poorer, less successful. So I got to scan Tony Robbins, love him, love his work. And we did a Facebook Live together and we talked about how he really teaches the software of success. But if the hardware is not working, that stuff's not gonna work. That really you have to work on getting the physical functioning of your brain healthy and then program it in that order. I heard you say that people feel, and I'm just gonna say women because that's mostly my audience, feel like they get more pushed around when their serotonin level's low. And I was like, hang on a minute. I've got a big audience that talks about confidence. Like a lot of us find it very hard to go after that job, to step up, you know, to the plate, if you will, to um, really set boundaries with people in our lives that may be toxic. And so I'm always talking about the software, right? What to say, how to do it. And then I heard you say, well, if your serotonin's low, then you're actually going to feel more likely to feel like someone's disrespecting you, to feel like someone's pushing you out. And I was like, this is why we need to talk about the brain. So hopefully now people are really paying attention of why it's important. Let's talk about serotonin. Oh, yeah. What drops serotonin? Birth control pills. And it's like your doctor doesn't tell you. If we start birth control pills, you now have a 40% increased risk of being depressed. And that doesn't mean you don't use birth control, but it means you know about the vulnerability and maybe supplementing with 5-HTP, which is an amino acid precursor for serotonin would be a good idea. Mm. And where do you get those? Is that like a pill form? It's a supplement. A supplement. It's, it's okay, a perfect. simple supplement. So the things that increase serotonin are sunlight, so vitamin D, um, sleeping, melatonin, exercise, because people go, oh, I get an endorphin high. Now you're really getting a serotonin high because tryptophan, so the amino acid tryptophan or the protein tryptophan goes from tryptophan to 5-HTP to serotonin. And tryptophan doesn't compete well to get into the brain because it's a bigger molecule. When you exercise, 
The other amino acids go into your muscles, leaving decreased competition for tryptophan, and you feel happier. So what depletes serotonin? Birth control pills. Being overweight, which is rampant, and so many people get in trouble if they talk about weight issues, mm -hmm. but I published three studies that show as your weight goes up, the size and function of your brain goes down. So we have to talk about it. I mean, it's like you can't not talk about yeah. that. Um, when you feel disrespected, serotonin levels drop. So you have to stop looking at the haters. And you have to stop looking at the comments and comparing yourself to other people in a negative way because it's depleting the chemical that makes you happy. Mm. God, that's so, I uh, thank you for laying that out because when you talk about exercise and nutrition and things like that, there's like the big disconnect between, I think, the, the weight issue, right? The, the self-esteem that goes behind the weight and then the what are the impacts it actually has on you? And so just saying, like, look, if we, we just need to be aware right now, right, that if your serotonin is low, this is how you're going to feel. Because to your point, if you're feeling like that, having tools to go to, Go out in the sun. Now, look, if you live in a cold place, what are the other things you can do? You can go and exercise. Bright light therapy. So there's like bright light therapy mm. lamps at Brain MD, which is my supplement company. We have, we developed this wonderful bright light therapy lamp, 20 to 30 minutes in the morning. So say you live in Maine or say Minnesota or even California. It's been raining like crazy here. 20 to 30 minutes in the morning in front of the lamp, it improves your mood and memory and will help you sleep better mm -hmm. tonight and your energy will be better. And your serotonin levels go up and it's so stinking simple, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so much of what I talk about is how do you make this easy? How do you make it free? How do you make it accessible? Mm, that's, I love that. Mm -hmm. And, um, so for, for instance, someone right now, if they were to feel like they, they want to boost their confidence, is that what you would say? Like go and actually try and boost your serotonin? That would be part of it. And if you want to boost your confidence, you have to be able to manage your mind. So first, brain healthy. Now you got to program it. And the brain is programmed for negativity. The brain is programmed for anxiety. It's programmed for fear. People wake up and they're like, what awful thing is going to happen today? Because those are the people that survived on the savannah. They like went, okay, there's trouble. And they're always looking for trouble. So many people are living with this undisciplined, negatively programmed mind. And it's not hard to reprogram it. You just, you have to do it consistently. Whenever you feel sad, whenever you feel mad, whenever you feel nervous or out of control, write down what you're thinking. And then just ask yourself whether or not it's true, whether or not this is a helpful thought or a hurtful thought. And no, thoughts come from all sorts of places and they may not even be yours. Mm -hmm. You may have gotten these thoughts from a prior generation. The whole issue of epigenetics and trauma in one generation can get written into your genetic code and affect you. And so I love my mind, but it's a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. And there's an exercise in the book called Give Your Mind a Name. And I named my mind after my pet raccoon. When I was 16, I had a pet raccoon. I grew up not very far from here. And I loved her. Her name was Hermie. I didn't know she was a girl when I got her. And loved her. But troublemaker, she TP'd my mother's bathroom. She ate all the fish out of my sister's aquarium. She'd leave raccoon poo in my shoes. But that's my mind. It's like always stirring up trouble. And so when I realize my thoughts aren't me, that it's just Hermie causing trouble, metaphorically, I'll put her in the cage and go, I'm not listening to you. And if you can gain psychological distance from the noise in your head, you suffer way less. So healthy brain, healthy directed mind, mm -hmm. like what do you want? It's one of the exercises in the books called One Page Miracle. Write it down. Right there is no CEO on the planet that 
doesn't have a plan, doesn't know what they, what he or she wants, doesn't know, okay, here's the plan. And this is what we're going to do this quarter, right? I mean, that's what a good CEO does. Well, you should have a plan for your life. What do you want for your relationships, your work, your money, your physical, emotional, spiritual health? What do you want? Write it down and then go, does this thought get me what I want? Mm -hmm. Rather than being a victim of your mind, manage it. So if you did that though, and then you wrote, like, is this true? Is this really when you put no? There's still a difference between writing the no down and feeling it. So how do you separate the fact from the emotion? Thoughts create feelings. Feelings create behaviors. Behaviors create the outcome. Mm. So you got to get your thoughts right. And I love the work of Byron Katie. Do you mm -hmm. know her? Yeah. I love her. And I have a process similar to hers. So you feel bad and you go, I feel really bad about this. And I'm like, okay, so what's the thought that's driving it? Is that true? And you might go, yeah. Is it absolutely true with 100% certainty? No, a lot of people say nice things to me, right? Mm -hmm. How does the thought make me feel anxious, self-loathing, awful? And how would I feel without the thought? Normal, happy. It's the thought that's making you suffer. Mm -hmm. And then you take the original thought and go to the opposite of it. Um, people say nice things about me. Give me an example. If you can find one, you probably find two. And if you find two, you can probably find four. Mm. And the turnaround's really interesting because we'll do it three ways. Opposite self, others, is I loathe myself. Oh, that's true. And so I don't have to loathe myself. And then I meditate on that. And then you go, what do you want? What gets you what you one. And it's this undisciplined mind that is driving mm. the epidemic mm. of teenage depression. You've spoken about really like the details of there are nuances between the, the genders, the male brain and the female brain. And m not to generalize, of course, but like right now, women suffer more with anxiety. We suffer more with depression. Um, why is that? So they're not small nuances, they're big ones. Mm. I published a study on 46,000 scans, one of the world's largest imaging studies ever on gender, looking at, so what's the difference? And women have much healthier activity in their prefrontal cortex, so the front third of the brain. Um, largest in humans than any other animal by far. It's 30% of the human brain, 11% of the chimpanzee brain, 7% of your dog's brain, um, unless you have a bulldog, mine was only 6%, 3% of the cat's brain, 1% of the mouse's brain. And it's a part of us that makes us human, females significantly more healthy activity in their frontal lobes, which is, and the frontal lobe's called the executive part of the brain. It's the CEO, because it's sort of like the boss at work. It helps mm -hmm. you with forethought and judgment, impulse control, organization, planning, empathy, learning from the mistakes you make. And who goes to jail? Males, 14 times more than females because their frontal lobes because are less Because we're able active. to assess a danger or the consequence more than a guy? Yes. That's insane. And um, females are off more communicative and they often have language on both sides of their brains where males, it tends to be more on one side or the other. Because of empathy, they're also more collaborative and they make good CEOs. Um, but because of the whole issue of family and children, they often are not because their careers get hijacked. Uh, so does that prefrontal lobe, if you're not using it for something like that, does it shrink? Like, does it shrink if you don't use it? Every part of your brain you don't use becomes less active over time. Mm -hmm. So you have to use it or you lose it. Mm -hmm. Now. 
the emotional brain, the limbic brain, is also much busier than male brain. And that's what puts them at greater risk for anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. So um, women have about twice the level of anxiety disorders and depression as males. Women also try to kill themselves three times more than males. But males, because of the means they use, are actually three times more effective. Is that part of, it's, do women actually want to commit suicide? Or in those moments, is it a sign of, I'm reaching for help and I don't know what else to do. And so the failure rate is almost like, we're doing it, oh God, I don't want to say deliberately, but like it's more, more of a cry for help than ending our life. But if a guy does it, they're like, no, I actually want to do it. Yeah, I know. I think there is something to that, that often for females, not always, but often it's a cry for help. Mm. Um, suicide, I tell all of my patients, um, this is a permanent solution to a temporary feeling because the feeling's going to go away. Um, and But people often think of um, killing themselves when they feel like they're out of options. Mm. And that's part of my job is to help them find other options, but also to let them know if you kill yourself, you've just increased the risk of your children killing themselves 500%. Whoa. So I'm never above using the truth and a little guilt. Uh, mm. and, and that's been very effective for me in, in my practice. It's like, let's, because when you're depressed, it's like your brain gets in a tunnel mm. and there's no windows and no doors. And all you see is your hopelessness and your pain. And you don't see the future of, if I do this, how is that going to impact? the people I care about. Wow. And you, I love that you actually said a little bit of guilt. I love how honest you are. Does it actually work more on women than men? Yes. Why is that? Because women respond more. Because they have more empathy. They have uh, a greater connection. Now, that's a generalization. But in my experience, that's also true. Yeah. And then talk to me about ADHD and how it actually manifests with a man and a female. Like I had, I read in your book, I was like, oh my God, that, um, you know, men with ADHD, it typically results in them being, you know, having infidelity and cheating. And for women specifically, it can all, like ADHD can impact like how, how you orgasm. Right. Yeah, it's that's actually a funny story. But uh, so ADHD <laughs> is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. A lot of people call it ADD or attention deficit disorder. Way more diagnosed in males than females. But I actually think they have it sort of the same. But boys bring negative attention to themselves mm. where girls people just sort of hope she marries somebody nice, even though that's terrible, but that's true. Almost like, well, when she finds someone, she'll calm down. Is that kind of like the, the messaging? You know, the hallmark symptoms for ADD are short attention span, mm. but not for everything. And this is what fools people. It's short attention span for regular routine, everyday things schoolwork, homework, mm. paperwork, chores, the things that make life work. For things that have their own intrinsic dopamine, because ADD is really a dopamine deficit disorder. So for things that are new, novel, highly stimulating, frightening, people with ADD can pay attention just fine. Mm. Which is why if you look at their grades, they have an A in one class and C's and D's and everything else, because they love the subject or they love the teacher. So short attention span, but not for everything. They're easily distracted. They see too much. They hear too much. They smell too much. They taste too much. It's like the world comes at them too quickly. So they can't block it out as non-ADD people can. They tend to be disorganized for time 
and space. So if you look at their rooms, their desks, their book bags, they tend to organize by the pile system, pile here, pile there, pile, pile everywhere. Um, they tend to put things off. They procrastinate until someone's angry with them to get it done, either the teacher, their parent, or their spouse. Um, and they can be pretty restless, not always, but often. Um, trouble sitting through a movie and they have impulse control issues. They say things they shouldn't say or do things they shouldn't do. And so people with untreated ADD, males and females, higher incidence of affairs, mm. higher incidence of bankruptcy, higher incidence of divorce, higher incidence of incarceration, higher incidence of substance abuse. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank. One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. It's, and people go, oh, I'd never give my ch child medicine. And I'm like, left untreated. Because, you know, whenever you think about medicine, you have to think, what are the side effects of doing it, taking it? Mm -hmm. And what are the side effects of not taking it? Which, you know, people aren't talking about. And it's sort of like, if you're educated, you would never put your child on medicine. And that's just not an educated thought, mm. right? I mean, I always, in, in, you know, you know from my work, first do no harm. I use the least toxic, generally mm -hmm. non-medicine things first. But if you really have ADD and changing your diet and supplements don't work, I'm totally drugging you, right? Because it's sort of like you need glasses and you change the environment around, but it still doesn't work. You get them the glasses. Otherwise, withholding it is sort of neglect. Yeah. And the brain imaging work I do has helped me see that the brain is an organ, like your heart is an organ, and you would never withhold treatment from the heart. And it's, I tell the story, Justin Bieber has been my patient and I love him. And um, he came into my office one day and he said, I think I get what you're trying to tell me. My brain is an organ like my heart is an organ. If you told me I had heart problems, I'd do everything you said. Now I'm gonna start doing what you say. Mm. And he got much better. That's so important. So what, what would be maybe the first few things that people can do if they're finding that they can't focus? Um, like, what would be some natural things that they could try? Well, you know, I think, and we could frame this whole discussion around three big ideas. So brain health is three things. Brain envy, you got to care about it. Freud was wrong. Penis envy is not the cause <laughs> of anybody's problem. I have not seen it once in 40 years being a psychiatrist. It's, this is the organ. He was two and a half feet too low. I'm like, dude, you're over-focused on the wrong organ. It's the brain. So you have to love it mm. and care mm. about it. And nobody loves their brain. Why? Because you can't see it. You can see the wrinkles in your skin or the fat around your belly, and you can do something when you're unhappy with it, but most people never look at their brain. So when I looked at mine for the first time in 1991, I wasn't happy because I played football in high school, I had meningitis twice as a young mm -hmm. soldier, and I had bad habits. And I fell in love with my brain. And 25 years later, fuller, fatter, healthier. I'm pretty excited about that. You're not stuck. So, gotta love it because it takes you through life. Avoid things that hurt it. You need to know the list. And then do things that help it. You have mm -hmm. to know the list. Mm -hmm. And so, whenever, you know, I had ADD, I don't, my brain's much more OCD. It's, but if I had it, I'd make sure I ask this question every day. Is what I'm doing good for my brain or bad for it? And if I can answer that with information 
and love, love of myself, my mission, my family, and just make better decisions. The things to do, I'd make sure I have enough magnesium and zinc because they both have been found to help people with ADD. I'd make sure I have enough omega-3 fatty acids. I'd make sure I exercise and I would get rid of all the crap in my diet because things like artificial dyes and sweeteners mm -hmm. can cause more behavior problems in children or adults. So is it better to start eliminating the things that we currently have? Because it's very difficult, I think, for a lot of people to just change their lives completely. And so some people find it way easier to do like one thing at a time. So you literally give 366 things that people can do on a daily basis for their brain. Um, but if they were to, like day one, is it elimination or is it additive? It's that question. That's the mother of tiny habit. So there are dozens of tiny habits, the smallest thing you can do today mm -hmm. that'll make the biggest difference. It's that three second question. Is this good for my brain mm -hmm. or bad for it? When my daughter, who's 19, was two, I used to play a game with Chloe called Chloe's Game. And I'm like, is this good for your brain or bad for it? If I'd say blueberries, she'd go, are they organic? <laughs> <laughs> because so non-organic blueberries hold more pesticides than almost any fruit. I'm like, of course they're organic. She goes, two thumbs up, God's candy. If I went avocados, she goes, oh, two thumbs up, God's butter. If I said, talking back to your redheaded mother, she'd go, oh, very bad. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it starts there. There's another story early in the book that I just dearly love uh, about Nancy from Oxford, England. And she's 80 years old. She's obese, depressed, has chronic pain, and thinks her life is over. And then she finds uh, my book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, in a used bookstore in Oxford for 50 cents. Wow. And lays around the house for a year, she said, but then she's like so tired of be feeling awful. Mm. She read it, said she was riveted, so that made me happy, and wrote down all the things to do. And she's like, way too much. And so just like she, you said, she's like, I'm gonna do one thing at a time. And she started hydrating. So she started drinking more water. Mm. Your body is 70% water. Your brain is 80% water. Any dehydration causes you to have problems with thinking. Mm -hmm. And I recommend you drink about half your weight in ounces a day. She was 200 pounds, that's 100 ounces. She said, I got off the couch, I had to pee. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> and, but she also said, I felt better. Mm -hmm. It's I felt like I was mobilizing. And being dehydrated increases pain. So her pain is less. And then she's like, okay, I'm gonna take supplements. And took a multiple vitamin and fish oil because of the omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D. Brand new study out last week. People who take vitamin D supplements, 40% less risk of Alzheimer's disease. Know your vitamin D level and work to optimize it. And you or I have never wanted to be average or normal. We wanted to be our best, mm. right? Until I'm 100, I want to be my best. That's why this is so important. Right. And so you love your brain and you do the right thing. And so you want to have high normal, optimal level of vitamin D. So she does that and she feels better. And then she's like, I'm going to go for a walk because she was in less pain with the mm. omega-3 fatty acids. And then she's playing table tennis, the world's best brain game. And she's dancing, not drinking, and dancing. If you drink and dance, it ruins the benefit. And she feels better. And then she changes her diet, and she feels better. And then she changed her family, which I love so much, because one of the things I say in the book is you gotta get this information and then you have to give it away. Mm. Because it is in the act of giving, you're creating your own support group, making it more likely you'll stay on the program mm. forever. And for her 83rd birthday, she gave herself the present 
of flying to California to one of my clinics and getting herself scanned. Now, I've seen thousands, maybe tens of thousands of older brains, um, and they don't look good generally. But her brain looks stunning. And she cried when she saw it because she said, I know last year it wouldn't have looked like that. She lost 70 pounds. And she said, I never thought life could be this good. And when she told me her story, I cried because she's the reason I do mm. what I do. But it goes to your point. You don't have to do everything, mm. but get started. And why I wrote the book in the way I did, it's just two to three minutes a day yeah. to read it. And then there's a simple exercise. So if you can give five minutes a day to the health of your brain quickly, mm. it changes. Uh, thank you for that. And um, so you said 40% for um, Alzheimer's. I also heard you say, and I can't remember if it was in your book or something else that I read of yours, but um, if even if you have a simple carb diet, um, that it raises your risk by 400% of Alzheimer's? Yeah, so there's a study at the Mayo Clinic where they looked at diet and Alzheimer's risk. And people who were on a fat-based diet olive oil, nuts and seeds, healthy fish, avocados, 42% um, less risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. People are on a protein-based diet, 21% less mm -hmm. risk. But people who are on a simple carbohydrate diet and think bread, pasta, potatoes, rice, fruit juice, sugar, a 400% increased risk. And many scientists are now calling um, Alzheimer's diabetes type 3. It's one of the reasons I eat mostly a keto diet because I'm not having a high blood sugar because high blood sugar erodes blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And I'd already said that low blood flow is the number one brain imaging predictor of Alzheimer's disease. And I've often said, you know, whatever's good for your heart, is good for your brain because your brain, even though it's only 2% of your body's weight, uses 20% of the blood flow and oxygen wow. in your body. It's the most expensive real estate mm. in your body. And 2007, I wrote my book, The Brain in Love, and I realized, oh, whatever's good for your heart is good for your brain is good for your genitals because it's all about blood flow. Right. And so many guys who go on my program, their loves, love life gets better. Um, do you know 40% of 40-year-old men have erectile dysfunction? 40%? 40%, that's horrifying. And 70% of 70-year-olds have erect, I'm not okay yeah, I know, right? with this. And you know, it's why on TV all the time you're seeing commercials for Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, um, because we are sick mm. as a society. But there are clear benefits to brain health. There are love benefits to it, plus your hair is thicker, not mine of course, your nails are stronger and your skin is prettier. In fact, the health of your skin is an outside reflection of the health of your brain. Oh my God. So, um, I don't, have you been to England before? I have. Okay. So have you ever seen the cigarette packets? I don't remember. So the cigarette packets in England, by law, they have to put a photo of, I can't remember what the exact law is, but they have to put a photo of what damage cigarettes can do. And so um, I have someone in my family that smokes, so I'm always seeing these packets. And so every so often there's like a photo of someone like in the hospital bed, bed with like tubes out of their mouth with like they just had like lung operation. And then one day there was one where it was basically wrinkles and it was a woman with wrinkles. And it was like, if you smoke, you get wrinkles. And my sister was like, uh oh. And like, she like pushes the cigarettes across. <laughs> and I was like, that's fascinating that most people won't respond to things that are happening internally because you can't see it. But the second you say, hey, do you want to be wrinkles? Do you want to look like, like an old bag, like at the age of 60? <laughs> Most women will say no. And so by using the external, and look, I'm not even judging, I'm the same. So by, but 
it's all about psychology, right? How do you influence someone and in which way? So knowing how powerful the brain is, knowing that because we don't take care of it, partly because we can't see it, how do we entice people to really take this seriously? I love that. I love the erection thing because let's face it, guys are going to pay attention to that. And so even when- And was, their wives will pay attention right, to Right, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but even when I was thinking about females, that was why I asked you about being disrespected because I'm like, what's that thing, Dr. Amon? What's that thing? where we start to pay attention now and actually take it seriously because look how confident you can be if you took care of your brain. Look at what beautiful relationships, look at what success can look like. If you take care of your brain, it's not just about how young do you look. It's not just about your skin. It's not just about, you know, the job or the, you know, the responsibility or how, you know, it's not about that. It's about the internal to then feed the external. Absolutely. And when your brain is healthier, it's just so much easier. Too often, mm. people engage in behaviors that help them feel good now, but not later. And I want them and teach them to feel good now, mm -hmm. quickly, and later. Yeah. And when it comes to the female brain, what a lot of people don't know is progesterone, one of the major female hormones, um, and progesterone, I think of it as the brain's natural anti-anxiety substance. And it sort of settles you down and you feel less anxious. About 10 years before women go into menopause, so around 40, progesterone levels tend to drop. And all of a sudden, they find themselves more irritable. Mm. They find that they can't sleep, that they're more anxious. And they go to their family doctor, or their OBGYN, and they end up on Ambien to help them sleep and Xanax to calm the anxiety and Lexapro to deal with their mood. And I'm like, why don't you just give them a little progesterone? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a huge fan of measuring your hormones right around day 19 or 20. And if they're low or if they're suboptimal, so maybe not even low, but suboptimal, just a little bit of replacement can help you feel good now and later, as opposed to the drugs you just got put on or marijuana, not good for the brain, um, or alcohol, which is the typical thing. And we've been lied to by the alcohol industry to think alcohol is a health food. That's a lie. And I've been saying this for 30 years because I look at people's brains and alcohol makes your brain look older than you are. And I'm not okay with that. I want my brain to look younger. Um, but last year I wrote a blog titled I Told You So, because the American Cancer Society came out against any alcohol. That was a huge deal because the research is really clear. Any alcohol increases your risk of seven different types of cancer. And cancer is bad, bad for the brain. The level of stress, chemotherapy is bad for the brain, radiation is bad for the brain, anesthesia is bad for the brain, it's just bad for the brain. And so the lie is this is normal, this is healthy, you should have it. In fact, I've been working with the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, I've had 17 public television specials on uh, PBS, and I went to an event, and they're serving alcohol. They're like, oh yeah, this is, this'll, pr I'm like, are you insane? <laughs> I'm like, come on, let us not model devastation. Wow. Um I, I don't actually drink much alcohol myself. I do smoke weed. So I'd love to talk to you about that. What is it actually doing to your brain? So I published a study on a thousand marijuana users, and then I compared them to non-users. Mm -hmm. Every area of their brain's lower in blood flow. Every area. 
And then I did a study, the world's largest imaging study on 62,454 scans on how the brain ages. And it's so interesting. When you're a little kid, your brain is super busy, and then it undergoes this wild construction and sort of balances out by the age of 25, and it stays stable until you're about 60, and then it starts to drop off. Mm -hmm. So that's the pattern of aging. And then we looked at what accelerated aging and being schizophrenic, so a very serious psychiatric disorder, your brain is 10 years older. Wow. The second worst thing was marijuana. It prematurely aged the brain, worse than alcohol, worse than cigarettes. And mm. data's coming out now that it's not innocuous. They actually mm. looked at people who smoke cigarettes versus people who smoked marijuana, and the lungs in the marijuana smokers were more damaged Whoa. than the nicotine users. And so, you know, my question to my patients always is, so why? And what else can we do? Mm. Right? Because I don't want you suffering, but I don't want you poisoning your brain. Now, if you're going to do that, well, let's make sure we do everything else right. Mm. Because I, I treat NFL players, and one of my players signed an $88 million contract. So he is not going oh. to stop playing football. So I'm like, okay, if you're going to do this, we have mm. to do everything else right. Yeah. And thank you for that. It was one of these questions where I'm like, I don't want to ask it. Obviously, I read your book. And so if I was tense about asking the question, like, which it means I have to ask the question, <laughs> um, because to your point, if everything that we're doing to ourselves is like, if you want to live to be 100, then you've got to take care of yourself now. If you want to be healthy at 60, you've got to take care of yourself in your 20s. So thank you for always being very honest. I love how upfront you are about that. Um, and talking about the fact that you said you're a little OCD, what is happening to the brain where when we have OCD? Because I find a lot of highly successful people have it. So when I say it for me, the front part of my brain is busy. So I'm always thinking, always working, mm. always engaged. If we go to like Hawaii for two weeks, I'm happy as a clam on the beach for about an hour. And then I'm <laughs> like, okay, I got to take care of my email or I'm working on a book or I mean, and mm. that's just me. I don't generally check locks or count or do sort of typical OCD things. Mm. But I'm driven. This is my 42nd book. So I, I love that. I love being engaged. For people who have ADD, for example, they have sleepy frontal lobes. And so they're often causing trouble to raise their dopamine mm. And that way they feel engaged. Like there's no way I'm jumping out of a good airplane. <laughs> there's just no way that is not gonna happen. That's me though, <laughs> I am, I'm jumping out. <laughs> I'm like, no, unless of course, it won't land safely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But is that what's happening? It's just overactive? Because a lot, so I obviously there's the extreme of people with the switches, right? Where it's like you have to switch on and off the light 20 times, otherwise someone yeah. in my life is gonna die. What's actually, in fact, let's start there. It's so fascinating. What is happening to someone's brain? That well, is there, well, it's so interesting. Um, usually we see the frontal circuit um, an area called the basal ganglia, an anterior cingulate, really busy. So it's almost like you got a scratch on that old vinyl record as they just hear the same thing over and over and over again. Um, but one of the most interesting things, and in my series, Scan My Brain, um, we did uh, actor Jason Waller, who failed 14 drug treatment programs. But when you really dig into his history, he had terrible OCD mm. as, as a child. And there's something called panda syndromes. I don't know if you've ever heard no. of that. It stands for pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders associated with strep. That, you know, a lot of people know you gotta get strep throat treated, mm. otherwise you can end up with rheumatic heart disease. Well, we found out about 30 years ago 
that those antibodies to strep can go to the basal ganglia, attack it, flame it, and all of a sudden triggers a new onset OCD. Mm. And so sometimes OCD can be the result of an infection that has gone untreated. Wow. I had no idea. I know, pretty wild, huh? Yeah. So if someone, because I actually have someone in my life that is very OCD, um, he he's able to manage it so that the, the, the world doesn't necessarily see it, but I definitely see it. And when he's by himself or around people he's comfortable with. And so it really is a, like, I wonder how many people kind of are suffering from that ex- sort of extreme OCD where it's starting to run their lives and they almost can't just let go. Like it's almost like a, a type of um, handcuffs, like shackles. Um, what are some things people can do in those situations? Like, and, and uh, in fact, I've noticed it correlates to um, when, when he starts to get depressed. So many people think OCD is related to the serotonin system. Mm. So we'll often use strategies to increase serotonin. But this is a really important point. Whenever you give in to a behavior, you reinforce it. Mm. And so you have to be very careful what you allow your brain to do Mm. because the brain's actually pretty lazy. And so if you give in to counting, to checking, to hand washing, you're gonna do it again. And so behavior therapists will prevent them from doing those behaviors. Initially, the anxiety goes way up, and then it goes down. And if you can keep yourself away from those behaviors long enough, you begin to extinguish Mm. them. And um, it's just true with negative thinking. The more you give into it, the more it'll run your life. With addictions, the more you give into it, the more it'll run your life. It's fascinating, but thinking of it from a brain science perspective destigmatizes it and gives you these sort of cool strategies to help. What part of the brain is activated as women where we're able to identify um, emotions faster and quicker and more accurately than guys? I heard you say this and I was like, this is fascinating. So it's the underside of the temporal lobes that help you recognize. But what's interesting about women, their intuition Mm. is up and social skill often is up. And it's because the tracks that connect the left and right hemisphere tend to be a bit bigger. So um, men have about 10% more volume in their brain. Women have more white matter White matter is nerve cell tracks. So think of it, they have more highways. And so they have greater access to the left and right hemisphere. And so my wife will often go, oh, I don't like this person. And I'm like, why? I don't know. But she's often right because she has access to the side of the brain that doesn't have language. So she doesn't know, but it's putting together lots of different pieces of information. Mm. And did that, is that due to like evolution being kind of like, as we were the nurturers, the stay at home, we, we needed to be very aware of what was happening around us? Well, and that's a great thought. When you have a baby, that remodels the brain. Mm-hmm. And a lot of women will say, no, I don't sleep anymore. Um, up at everything, and then they just start nurturing and caring for everybody. But when they go through menopause, they stop that. (laughs) And that's why divorce rates go way up. And you know, if someone files for a divorce, three quarters of the time, it's a woman Mm. who's filing for divorce. And she's like, I told you, I told you. And of course, he wasn't paying attention. And that's actually really important to say, because when I heard that, I was like, I feel bad that I kind of judge my husband a little, you know, like, let's face it, a lot of us women, when we got the intuition, you're like, you don't sense it. And you're kind of just like, you know, what's wrong with you? You didn't see that? You didn't see how that person looked at that person? Um, And so this is why I'm I'm so fascinated about talking about the brain and then the difference between the female and the male, because just your work alone has allowed me to understand my husband better, to help me communicate with him better, because now I literally don't judge him. So like, the joke is, is that 
Men go into a cupboard, right? And it's like, I don't see whatever they're trying to look for. Where's the plate? I don't see the plate. And the woman walks over and just like grabs the plate and passes it to him. But knowing that it's actually the brain structure that allows a woman to notice things more than the guy. Now, anytime my husband's like, babe, I can't find it. I never make fun of him. I never even giggle about it. I'm just like, it's all right, babe, I got your back and I go and find it for him. And so like, I, I find that sort of thing fascinating. Well, and you practice something really important if you want to keep a good marriage is notice what you like way more mm. than what you don't like. So have empathy for their vulnerabilities and notice what you like. It's just there's a, a whole group of days in the book on relationships and uh that one thing, and there's a cool story about why I collect penguins, which is, I love that story. And, and it's just, we have to train our brain to look for what's right about ourselves, but also with the people we care about. Do you mind sharing that? Because that was so genius when I read it. Well, uh, I have six children, and I've adopted three of them. And the oldest was hard for me. And he was three when I adopted him and just argumentative, oppositional. And I was so devastated because I was like so looking forward to be being a good dad because my dad wasn't a good dad. He was gone all the time and he wasn't a good dad. And, and I'm heartbroken because nothing I do is working with this kid. And I'm a child psychiatry fellow at the time, so I'm just learning how to be a child psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And I go to my supervisor, and I'm like, Lois, I feel like a failure. And she said, I want you to spend more time with him. And um, so that weekend, I took him to a place on Hawaii. I was doing my training in Hawaii. They have a place called Sea Life Park, which is sort of like Sea World or Marine World. And I took him to the whale show and that was fun. And then the dolphin show and that was cool. And the sea lion show and we were having a really good day. And at the end of the day, he grabbed my shirt and he pulls it and he said, I wanna see Fat Freddy. I'm like, who's Fat Freddy? He's like, the penguin dad, don't you know anything? And that's sort of the quality of our relationship. <laughs> and so we found the show, it was the last show of the day. And this little, fat, adorable penguin comes onto the stage, climbs a high dive, the ladder to a high diving board, goes to the end of the board and bounces on it and then jumps in the water. And he gets out of the water and counts with his flipper, jumps through a hoop of fire, um, just blown away. And then at the end of the show, the trainer asked Freddie to go get something. And Freddie went and got it, and he brought it right back. And the world stopped for me, because in my head I went, damn, I asked this kid to get something for me, and he wants to have a discussion. And he doesn't want to do it, and I knew he was smarter than the bird. And so I went up to the trainer afterwards, and I said, how did you get Freddie to do all these really cool things? And she looked at my son, and then she looked at me, and she said, I'm like parents. Whenever Freddie does anything like what I want him to do, I notice him, I give him a hug, and I give him a fish. And the light went on in my head that even though my son didn't like raw fish, that whenever he did what I wanted him to do, I didn't pay any attention to him because mm -hmm. I was like my dad. Mm -hmm. And I was noticing what was wrong way more than what was right. So I collect penguins as a way to remind myself to notice the good things about the people in my life. Every day I shape the people around me by what I notice. And it just, it helps me so much because with my wife, I mean, I'm very clear with what I want with her. Kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship. Mm. I want that all the time, but I don't always feel like it. I get rude thoughts in my head and when I'm smart, when I've slept, when I've had something to eat, when I'm not terribly stressed and don't believe every stupid thing I think, I inhibit those crazy thoughts, right? You just should never say everything you think. <laughs> and 
if and when I, I just know that if we're starting to fuss, it's like, are you noticing what you like more than what you don't? Now, both of us are also very assertive, and if we really don't like something, we'll say it. But it's it's the mindset of shaping people with positivity. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, and in that on that note, I think it was an interview that I heard you say, and I had to pause because I was like, oh my God, I've got to go deep on this. You said that married men live typically longer than single men. Married women don't typically <laughs> live longer than single women. And in fact, we probably die earlier. And I was like, what are, Dr. Eamon, why? Like what is happening to our brains where a man will live longer but a woman, actually, a woman actually dies younger. Well, it's clear why men live longer, because she makes him go to the doctor. She yells at him when he's texting while he's driving. I mean, it's like she's the supervisor. And they're taking care of Maybe their care. brood. Mm -hmm. And women live less long because of the chronic stress from the men. <laughs> I literally, when I heard you say that, I was like, well, what do we do about that? Like, and in fact, actually, what do we do about that? You take care of yourself. You, you know, when you're on a plane and someone says, if the cabin pressure goes down and the masks come down, put yours on first. Mm -hmm. And women don't do that. I have seen they take care of everybody else and they don't take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not right, trust me, nobody else is going to be right. <laughs> and so having some time for self-care is critical and it's hard. I mean, I've watched this as three generations of working women now and they're tired. Mm -hmm. I mean, the huge benefit of the pandemic was families could reconnect. And I don't know anybody else that's talking about this, mm -hmm. but I certainly as a psychiatrist, I saw it is for three generations, like here in California, 90% of mothers work outside the home. So if you just imagine being the primary caretaker of the children, primary caretaker for the home, and you're also worrying about your husband's health, and um, it's you're just tired. And you have now with social media, the expectation is mm. I should have everything, I should have it all, and, and you're just tired. Mm. And during the pandemic, they didn't have to travel. They could stay home. And for me, I loved it. I, I hated the pandemic. But the fact I have um, my daughter who just turned 16, my adopted niece who was 15, they're always gone. Then the pandemic had, they had to spend two hour dinners with me. And the level of bonding and connection for many families just skyrocketed. Wow. Um, and that was beautiful. But I'm very worried about women mm. because they're just doing so much. And I heard you say that shame actually is really detrimental for your brain. And I think that a lot of women, I mean, we spoke about guilt earlier, but a lot of women, like, you know, obviously this is the space that I'm, I am in. And the shame and guilt and things like that really are a big thing that women find hard to battle. And so when I heard you say that shame was bad for the brain, explain that to me. Because it's chronic stress and stress hormones mm. put fat on your belly, so you don't want that, mm. and mm. shrink the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is such an important structure in the brain. So it's on the inside of your temporal lobes, deep in your brain. It's called the hippocampus because that's Greek for seahorse. It's shaped like a seahorse. And every day, your hippocampus produces 700 new baby stem cells, and stress shrinks them. Marijuana shrinks them. In fact, there's a fun story in the book about Miley Cyrus, who's one of my patients who I adore, who has the number one song in the world, so I'm so proud of her. And the song's Flowers, it's about self-love. But there was the issue with marijuana that everybody knows, and I'm like, you're killing the baby seahorses. And she's like, Dr. Eamon, that's so unfair. You know I love animals. <laughs> you used that on purpose then, didn't you? I did. Yeah. I did. And <laughs> I, want, I said, I want you to love your brain mm. way more than Mary Jane. 
So, in <laughs> as, we, as we're talking about um, the, the the male female and then like the marriage thing, it really is like the, the relationship part of it. Because when I think about why am I doing it, like what do I actually want to take care of my brain? Because I think the why is so important. So it's not just to be able to show up and live out my dream. It really is to be able to live a long time with my husband, the love of my life. I've been able to spend 22 years with him, and now the idea that I can spend another 50, 60 years with him is so exciting to me. But I need to make sure that. I don't die early, that I don't get Alzheimer's and forget him. Um, and so as I started to almost dive into more of your world between the difference and like how our brains really function, I've heard you, what was the title? You call it the neuroscience to romance. And so I'd love if you don't mind breaking this down because there's so much um, like reasoning behind why we do things. And when we're talking about um male, female, how we keep connecting with each other versus almost like walking past each other or talking past each other. Your breakdown of the neuroscience to romance was genius. Um, do you mind if you'd break that down for us? Can I take a detour first? Of course, yeah, please. Um, so you're beginning to articulate why you want a healthy brain. And I love that. Too often when people go, I can't drink. I can't mm -hmm. use drugs. Uh, bad food is probably out. Mm -hmm. How can you have any fun? Mm -hmm. And in my high school course, when we do the, the unit on things to avoid, invariably, and it's never a girl, so I think you'll like this, it's always a boy, it's irritating, <laughs> raises his hand and goes, how can you have any fun? And we play a game with them called Who Has More Fun? Mm. The kid with the good brain or the kid with the bad brain? Who gets the girl and gets to keep her because he doesn't act like an ass? The kid with the good brain or the kid with the bad brain? Who gets into the college? They want to get into who saves the most money, has the most meaning and purpose, does the best at work? The kid with the good brain or the... So mm. it's very important to change mm. your mindset away from I can't do this, I can't do that, to I get to do this because I'm going to be 69 this year. What do I want? I want energy and I want memory and I want clarity and I want good decisions and I want connection and... Are those things enhanced by a healthy brain or not? And, you know, I told you I have six children. I love them all. But quite honestly, I never want to live with them. I, I've done that. I never want to be a burden on them or to give up my independence. And I think people should be thinking about that at 40. And many, and many do because they're beginning to have to take care of their own parents. Mm -hmm. So if you can shift your mindset away from, I can't, to, oh, I get to do the right thing because that gets me what I really want, mm -hmm. then you're not gonna have a bad attitude about it. So yeah, the why is very important and I've really processed it and it really is like the Alzheimer's is A for my husband and then my grandmother had dementia. And Dr. Amy, it, it becomes really freaking real when you're sitting there with your grandmother who you looked up to since you were a kid and she's just spitting on the floor and swearing. It fucking broke my heart. It broke my heart. And so seeing someone you love do that, where you're like, no sign of them. I was just like, fuck, I don't want my mum to be like that. I don't want to be like that for my husband, for the people that care about me, for them to see me like that. So my why is very strong, as you can see. An intelligent life is thinking, what's my life going to be like five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, at the end of my life? Do I want to be a burden or do I want to be in charge? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Of course, I, know, yeah, it's I hard. need to get myself all back to the, sorry, give me a second. <laughs> I'm not used to getting emotional on the show, but that it's, it's very real for me. It is very real. And then because I've seen it in women specifically, that's why it's just so shocking that women do, you know, suffer from Alzheimer's more to your point. It's like we want to live longer, 
But in trying to live longer, now we're really doing such a detriment to our brain. So it's like, how do we live longer and take care of ourselves to your point of being there for the people that we love? Yeah, is this good for my brain or bad for it? Mm -hmm. And if it's not... What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. I mean, even simple things like plastic bottles that they leach toxins. And so, if on the bottom it's a two, a four, or a five, it's much better for you mm -hmm. than if it's a one, a three, a six, or a seven. And so I, I think it's it's just critical to go, whatever I'm putting in my body or on my mm -hmm. body, um, does it serve me? And so Bright Minds, again, that mnemonic I use, the T is toxins. And we talked a little bit about alcohol and marijuana, mm -hmm. But there are a whole bunch of other toxins. Just um, one going through the bright lines, we didn't actually get a chance to go through that. So B is for blood flow, low blood flow, number one brain imaging predictor of Alzheimer's. And in the book, it's like, okay, well, how do you get low blood flow and what do you do about it? Mm -hmm. So like caffeine, nicotine, um, marijuana, being overweight, being sedentary, they all decrease blood flow, any form of heart disease, hypertension. What increases blood flow? Exercise, ginkgo, uh, beets of all things, uh, oregano, rosemary, cinnamon. Um, the R is retirement and aging. The older you get, the more serious you need to be. Mm -hmm. And that's where I also put, if you're in a job that does not require new learning, you're at a higher risk for Alzheimer's mm. disease. So the fact that you're doing this podcast, you're reading, you're learning, you're engaged, you're always making new connections in your brain, that's really good for your brain. People should Can I have a table tennis table? I don't know if you noticed. I didn't. How oh, exciting. I read about how that's like the perfect exercise, right? It's the perfect exercise. So get a coach and get good. Because when you get your eyes and hands and feet all working together while mm. you think of the spin on the ball, that's great for your brain. And people who play racket sports live longer than everybody else. Uh, people who play football live less long than anybody else. Uh, the eye is inflammation which is a universal risk factor for mm. Alzheimer's disease, but also depression and cancer. Um, so it increases inflammation, low levels of omega-3 fatty acids, which about 98% of the population is suboptimal levels. Wow. How much should we be having then on the daily? At least 1,400 milligrams balanced between EPA and DHA. Okay. Um, gum disease is a major cause mm. of brain disease. And like, I didn't know that, but I started reading gum disease causes heart disease. Oh, it also causes brain disease. So make sure you're getting your teeth cleaned, you're flossing, you're taking, you don't have gingivitis or periodontal disease. Um, processed foods, you know, the standard American diet. California is now on this new kick to ban uh, some artificial dyes, and I think that's brilliant. Um, the G is genetics. So you were talking about things you have in your family. Mm. Genes load the gun. It's what we do that pulls the trigger. And so I often think we think about genes the wrong way. Um, there's this one story about two brothers. One was an alcoholic and one wasn't. Um, their father was an alcoholic, and you asked the kid who wasn't, an alcoholic, he's like, why Why don't you drink? He said, because my father is an alcoholic. And when they asked the other one, who was an alcoholic, why are you an alcoholic? He said, because my dad's an alcoholic. And I'm like, so one got it wrong, the other one got it right. I have obesity and heart disease in my family, but I'm not overweight and I don't have heart disease. Mm -hmm. 
Why? I'm on an obesity heart disease prevention program every single day mm -hmm. of my life. So I had dementia in my family. I would be on a dementia prevention program. It's the same thing every day mm -hmm. of my life. If I had addiction, two of the kids I adopted, our nieces, their parents have addictions, and I drill it in their head. You need to be on an addiction prevention program every day of your life. I actually taught them a new word uh, called scrumiting. Have you heard of that? No. It's a combination of screaming and vomiting. It's what ha it's what's happening in emergency rooms all over America as marijuana has become legalized. Pe young people are being poisoned by because the doses of marijuana are ten times stronger than when I was a kid, and the scrumiting is everywhere. It's gross. Um, so that's genetics. H is head trauma, a major cause of psychiatric problems that nobody knows about. Your brain is soft about the consistency of soft butter. Your skull is really hard and has sharp bony ridges. Mild traumatic brain injury It's a major cause of psychiatric problems. Uh, and then T is toxins. And, you know, initially when I started scanning people as the director of a substance abuse treatment program, and I've got, well, those are not healthy brains. But then I'm like, well, mold can do that. Mm -hmm. And heavy metal exposure can do that. And general anesthesia can do that. They don't even put that on the warning for you're signing your life away. This could kill you, but it doesn't tell you anything. It could hurt your brain. And, um, and I like this app called Think Dirty. It um, lets you scan your personal products. Mm -hmm. And it'll tell you on a scale of one to 10 how quickly they're killing you. Oh, what's it called? Think dirty. All right. And so, for example, I shaved with Barbasol for 50 years. And then I'm like, well, let me scan it. And, you know, one is good and 10 is kill you early. It's a nine. Oh. And I'm like, oh no, I like myself way too much than to put toxins on my body that steal my hormones. Because things like parabens and phthalates and uh, bisphenol A, they're hormone disruptors. Mm. And you want to love your hormones. We'll get to that. And mental health issues. So if a woman has depression, it doubles her risk for Alzheimer's disease. But if a man has depression, it quadruples his risk. Wow. It's really interesting. In fact, some people think depression in middle age or older men is a prodrome for dementia. Oh. And so, like, we need to take it serious, which is why you should be looking at people's brains. I mean, I mean, that's sort of the big innovation yeah. that I created was if you don't look, you don't know, stop lying about it. Um, the second eye is immunity and infections. So low vitamin D levels or having an immune system. People often go, oh, I have an autoimmune disorder and these are the drugs I'm taking for that. I'm like, why do you have an autoimmune disorder? I was like, oh, the doctor never told me why. It's like, so why is your body pissed off at you? You know, <laughs> autoimmune means friendly fire. It means your soldiers are rebelling against you and they're trying to hurt you. Why? And often, you know, it's either an infection or a toxin or it's the food you're eating, something. Um, and COVID, oh my goodness, there's so much to talk about with the brain and COVID, but post COVID's real. COVID changes your brain for a lot of people in a negative way. And so learning how to put the inflammation out in your brain is critical. The N is neurohormone disorders. We talked about that from progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, thyroid, cortisol. Um, test your hormones every year and work to optimize them. And you work to optimize them by getting rid of things that kill them. So for example, being overweight takes healthy testosterone and flips it into unhealthy cancer-promoting forms of estrogen. And so that's why being a healthy weight is important. The D is diabetes, being overweight or obese with having high blood sugar 
and that's a disaster. It's mostly why I do keto. My blood sugar tends to run high, but when I do keto, not at all. It is just perfectly balanced. Um, and S is sleep. And so that's bright minds. And that's what I've come to realize. You want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it, know which of those risk factors you have and go after mm. them. And if you do that the rest of your life, the odds are you're not getting dementia. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for breaking that down. I think that's really clear for what people need to um, look at. I heard you say that I was like, I've just got to, it's, the, it's, it's a funny quote and I love it. So I wanted to like t uh, tell you, um, pretty women make men pretty stupid. <laughs> So, There's research behind that. At, why do you think in Las Vegas that they have half-naked women serving alcohol? There's a return on investment for that because the men are looking at her cleavage drinking alcohol that drops their frontal lobes. Who's going to win? I mean, the house already has an advantage, and now they have a masterful advantage. So they actually did fMRI studies showing men pictures of pretty and not so pretty women and looked at their frontal lobe function. And with the pretty women, their frontal lobes drop. That's insane. An activity. So it drops when they see a pretty woman, which means that they're more likely to drink alcohol. Is that what you said? And then that No, they're more likely to make a bad decision. Oh, okay. So Dr. Oz and I, uh, when he had his show, we actually looked at um, what happened when he smoked caffeine. So he's vaping Smoke caffeine. Mm. And it activated his occipital lobes, which means he could see better, and it dropped his frontal lobe. Whoa. So I'm like, oh, you're going to see one of the cute interns that worked for you, and you're much more likely to make a bad decision. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> and so um, you just have to know. Yeah, you know, I call this practical neuroscience. It's the neuroscience somebody should have taught you in school that just helps you live a yeah. better life. No, I love that. But the, then the question is, if if I see a guy that's very handsome, does the same thing happen to me? No. You're you're much less likely to make a bad decision. Why is that? Because your frontal lobes don't drop. Oh, oh so it literally. But just your pleasure drop. centers go up. Oh, you're right, like, okay. oh, I like that, but. That's fascinating. <laughs> and, and that's even, even something like that actually helps me understand the other sex. Like, again, it's the, people may think I'm crazy, but I'm just going to say this is how I think. Oh, now I actually don't mind. Or oh, I get why well, my husband's going to stare at another woman. It's like, ah, it's his prefrontal lobe. Like, I kind of, like, almost understand that it's part of the brain function and that's just what naturally happens now of course to me there's no excuse for cheating so let me just be abundantly clear but if a guy looks at another woman i don't know like i think a lot of people in um, take that in as an insult to them but now almost just saying but that's how yeah, brains but that's work. a sign of insecurity if they take it as an insult to them that's a wound that they have mm -hmm. i mean the fact that your guy or girl, whoever it is, appreciates someone else. It's like, so what? They're human, right? They saw someone mm. attractive, their brain reacted, and they're like, oh, that's awesome. Mm. Um, now, if they spent the night with her, you totally should be. I, unless, and, and I say this to my patients all the time, it's in, if you're in a relationship, what's the agreement? Mm. If the agreement is we are in an exclusive relationship and you betray that, that's hard to get back. Because what we saw, especially in the female brain, her hippocampus is larger. She's got memory. <laughs> My wife will tell you stuff I did 15 years ago. that, And, and I'm like... And that's the hippocampus? It's the hippocampus. But there is something to... I mean, you know, not to go down this rabbit hole, but there really is something to, like... Guys look at younger women all the time. And when I understand why, again, there's no excuse for the action, but at least when I understand why, it becomes very easy for me to accept it. And so when I learned that, I can't remember, you know, but like, yeah, when I learned that and obviously heard your quote, I was like, it's just how his uh, men's brains are structured. So I actually have less, if I'm going to be honest, judgment on it. 
I'm, I'm just being trying to be as transparent as possible. And less and judgment of- is good. And it probably means his testosterone levels are healthy. Mm-hmm. Now, it's very important to not let his testosterone levels get too high because because a lot of men take testosterone. When they go above the optimal range, people get sexual and they have less empathy. And that's the prescription for mm. divorce because you need empathy. So we're always looking for the optimal level. More is not better yeah. with testosterone. Dr. Stanley Amen, this has been so amazing. I literally, I could talk to you for so long. You've, you're such a wealth of knowledge. And even what you've shared today, I really hope helps people like to move forward, to take their brain seriously, and then to get your book. You literally get 366 things that people can do. So where can they find you? Where can they find all your amazing content and your new book? Thank you so much. Uh, the book is out uh, anywhere great books are sold, so Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And they can find me at Amen, like the last word in a prayer, amenclinics.com. Uh, I have 11 clinics around the country where we do our imaging work and help people heal. And then on Instagram at docdoc underscore amen or on TikTok at docamen. Keep watching to learn the root cause of Alzheimer's and how you can prevent it right now. Where I want to start, I want to just jump right into something that you call bikini medicine. And I have a quote of yours um, that describes bikini medicine. Um, And it's assuming that women are essentially men with breasts and tubes, yet women are far more more likely than men to suffer from anxiety, depression, migraines, brain injuries, and strokes. They are also twice as likely to end their lives suffering from Alzheimer's disease, even when their longer lifespans are taken into account. Talk to me about bikini medicine. Yes, bikini medicine has been a big issue for me as a scientist. And bikini medicine is is saying that from a medical perspective, what makes a woman a woman is literally just those parts of the body that we can fit under a bikini or that are covered by a bikini. So her breasts, her tubes, her ovaries. And that has meant that historically, medical professionals would diagnose and treat both genders the same exact way thinking that if i'm testing a medicine for the brain i can just test it in a bunch of men and whatever i find is going to apply to women as well and the same for the heart right if i have a heart medication that works for men it is just assumed that it would work the same for women and that is completely not the case it's just not the truth and we know that I mean, if you, if you take a bunch of basic scientists or biologists, they will tell you metabolism is different. Women absorb nutrients and drugs very differently than men do. And the same drug may have completely different effects in men and women. And then you just go to discover the science, which is what I do for the most part. And there's a complete disregard for women's brains as a whole. For a very long time, women were not even included in research. And now that we do include them, we never look at women as being different from men, which is lump men and women together. And then actually we've removed the effects of sex using statistical manipulations, which is really saying once again, even now in 2021, is really saying that women are broadly indistinguishable from men, except there's some ovaries in there. That's so powerful. And that's where really where I wanted to start because really shining the light of how important this is and everything like I've known up until this day, um, like your book really made me rethink things. And I think that's so incredible for us to just give the awareness to people first. And that's really where I wanted to, why I wanted to start there because I think it begins with awareness. And then like you get so tactical in your book about what you can do and how you can eat and how you can optimize your brain as a female, which we're definitely going to get into. But just to really give people the actual like hard truth about what you're saying about how medicine up until this point hasn't treated men and women differently. Um, can you talk us through the ambient and what happened there? Because I think that really highlights how a study can lead us women astray 
Yes, so Ambien is the most popular sleep medication, at least in the United States, but I think there are similar formulations all over the world. And the drug was mostly developed um, in clinical trials that included mostly men. Even the preclinical studies, because usually drugs are tested in animals first, in animals first, usually it's mice or rodents. In the vast majority of preclinical studies are really focused on male animals. Female animals are not included because scientists would say that hormonal fluctuations make them too variable to study. And so they just look at the male animals and then assume that the drug that works for a male mouse will work for an actual woman, which is not the case. But long story short, women used to be given very high doses of Ambien because the doses were based on men, on men's body's ability to metabolize the drug and obtain a certain amount of efficacy, right? And then what happened, which is really bizarre, is that insurance companies started asking, what is going on with women? Why are all these women getting into car crashes? And the answer was Ambien. There were women who were taking men derived doses of, of sleep medications and would literally overdose and sleepwalk throughout the day and then get into car accidents, not because they can't drive, but because they were effectively over medicated. And so a number of scientists really knocked on the door of the FDA and said, we have to cut down the dose, which was eventually cut in half. And now it is safe to take, but just think about all the million women who were injured or, or literally got in trouble for simply following guidelines that completely disregarded the woman's physiology, right? And the knowledge that their bodies just don't work the same way. Yeah, that's it. when I heard you tell that story, that's so powerful because it just gives people a perspective of how what we've been taught up to this point. Um, and now how do we shift that thinking and shift um, the, the studies that we're doing and the way that we approach it as women. And so if you can take me deeper now on the, the, the XX brain, as we like to refer to as the female brain, the XX brain, um, and why it's very important to understand the XX brain that is different to the XY brain. Mm. I think it is really important to, to realize that their brains are just not the same. And, and the most important factor in my opinion is that women's brains don't age the same way the men's brains age. And when I say age, I'm not thinking 80s or 90s. I mean, from, from the beginning of your life, from the moment you're born, actually even before a baby is born, our brains are wired a little bit differently to respond to stimulation differently, whether the stimulation be hormones or enzymes or stress or just life. And the reason that this is important is that men's brains and women's brains are not different in the sense that one is better than the other. I, I really want to be clear about that. We're not supporting gender stereotypes. I'm not saying that, you know, pink and blue is a thing that girls should play with dolls and boys should be given trains. That's not the point. Mm. The point is that the way that the brain is built or the way that the brain functions really dictates different strengths and different vulnerabilities. And that is very important. We all know that women have a better verbal memory than men, for example. There are people who debate that, there are people who don't believe it, but on average across studies, women have an edge when it comes to remembering verbal information. That's a strength that is hardly ever celebrated, right? But at the same time, there, there's also risks that impact women's brains more. And we never talk about this, but for context, you mentioned those risks before, but I really want to clarify the magnitude of the problem, yeah. right? So women are twice as likely as men to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder or depression. And there are millions of people with anxiety or depression. We're three times more likely to develop an autoimmune condition, including those that attack the brain, like multiple sclerosis. We're four times more likely to suffer from migraines and headaches, as any woman knows. <laughs> <laughs> 
And we're also more likely to die of a stroke or to develop certain forms of brain tumors already in our 30s and 40s. And on top of all this, women are twice as likely as men or almost twice as likely as men to develop Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia on the planet, which means that for every man with Alzheimer's disease, there are two women. And no one talks about it, right? When you talk about women's health or women's health issues, we're all thinking about breast cancer. That's mm-hmm. the first thing that comes to mind, right? It has the pink ribbon, as it should. Yeah. But the bottom line is that a woman in her 60s is almost twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease in her life than she is to develop breast cancer. That is so insane. Right, it's frightening and it's scary. And we don't talk about it, right? Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think if it's that dramatic that it hasn't become the norm discussion? Because it has not been started that way. So I have a family history of Alzheimer's disease that really affects the women in my family. And I always wanted to study the brain. So as soon as I was able to, I started asking questions. Like, is it just my family? Is it everybody? And back then, people would say to me, well, you know, after aging itself, being a woman is the most significant risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. However, it doesn't really matter because women live longer than men and Alzheimer's is a disease of old age. So it's really just the women live longer. And, huh, okay. But then you look at the numbers and women don't live that much longer than men. <laughs> like in the United States, the difference is four years, not 20. In England, the difference is two and a half years. And Alzheimer's disease or dementia is the number one cause of death only for women and not for men. So there's something more clearly, yeah. right? And we started looking into that years ago. And long story short, we show that number one, not just us, but scientists show that Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of old age, but starts in midlife with negative changes to the brain that then eventually lead to the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, the memory loss, the confusion, all those kind of issues. And midlife is any age from 35 to 65. <laughs> and so, so it's not midlife and some fuzzy 60 year old thing is like 35 40 years old you're middle aged just for clients is frightening yeah yeah <laughs> but then that changed the question my question then was okay if alzheimer's disease starts in midlife what is it that happens only to women and not to men in midlife that could potentially trigger alzheimer's disease in a woman's brain yeah And we show that the answer is menopause and losing your hormones, which really was very, very unexpected and changed the way that we work and that we think about prevention. So I think it's really about women's brains, not just Alzheimer's or menopause or this or that. It's more about getting a sense of the full picture. Yeah, and look, to me, I'm always, how do I get the full picture, the accurate information so that I can then adjust accordingly, right? It's it's like, what life do I want? And then how do I act in my current life in order to set me up for future successes? And so when I think about how cognitive aware I want to be for my entire life and then what are the things that I'm doing now in not just showing up now to have clarity of mind and you know to have a good memory but also for the long term you talk about the three p's so you've got puberty pregnancy and then premenopausal perimenopause perimenopause um so can you actually take us through so let's say you're going through puberty what is happening to the brain there and so that we can kind of break it down and then, yeah, then we'll talk about the pregnancy part. Yes, so during puberty, puberty is like an explosion of hormonal power because this is really when your ovaries basically turn on and they start producing hormones that give you a menstrual cycle and those allow you to get pregnant. And that's been happening earlier and earlier on in life. At this point, some some girls 
uh, go through puberty when they're 11. The average age is 12. And that is a huge change, not just for the body, but also inside the brain. And you would think that all these hormones would have a sort of boosting effect on the brain, right? But when you actually do brain scans and you look at the brain of adolescents, the brain is shrinking. As you get older. As you get older, your brain is shrinking, even though your body is growing at that stage. And a lot of connections between neurons are discarded with a process that is called pruning. Because what happens when you're born is that your brain just shoots out neurons the whole time. And all these neurons form connections with other neurons that are called synapses. But many of these connections at some point are no longer useful because your brain can go on autopilot. Right. By the time you're 12, you know how to ride a bike, you know how to tie your shoes, you know how to make your own lunch. So all those connections can go and make room for new connections. So they're mostly related to social cognition and really becoming a, a member of society. So you need to grow brain regions. So some brain regions shrink because they're no longer needed, those neurons are not needed anymore. But other brain regions actually grow, like the memory center of the brain grows. The emotional center of the brain is called the amygdala, that also grows. The frontal cortex, which is in charge of judgment, planning and reasoning and controlling instincts and impulses, also grows a lot during adolescence. Does that grow in a different way to then the XY brain, the male brain? Yes. So these connections are stronger in girls, in teenage girls. They develop earlier on in life relative to boys' brains. And that has been interpreted as girls reaching maturity, intellectual mm. maturity, a little bit earlier on than men, but also mostly about being more on top of things and like being better at judging the situation and also being able to manage risks a little bit more effectively. And at that point, your verbal abilities are also better as a girl, mm -hmm. language is more developed and a few other things. And again, these differences are subtle and there's no need to overemphasize them, but it is interesting to see that the trajectory of development it is a, are a little bit different between both so does that have then a knock-on effect depending on them when you get as a female when you get your period so like if you got your period ah. later would your brain develop l later partially so what happens with the menstrual cycle is that as the hormones change and fluctuate throughout the month so does your brain and so do your brain connections so when estrogen levels are highest, which is right before ovulation, that's literally when you can see, which is incredible, you can see the synapses firing up and dendrites growing. Dendrites, so neurons look like trees a little bit, and the branches are called dendrites. You can see these branches literally growing and expanding right before ovulation, and then withdraw when your estrogen goes down before menstruation. So even throughout the menstrual cycle, the brain changes on a weekly, if not daily basis. And granted, these are not huge changes, but they are significant enough for some women to feel the change, right? So many women are intuitively aware mm -hmm. that their mood changes throughout the menstrual cycle, that their focus is different, their energy is different. And that's in part hormonal and in part is literally that your brain is changing along with your reproductive organs. And it's wonderful. And that is pretty much stable throughout a woman's reproductive life until you get pregnant. I think what, what we're missing in general is the fact that people are organisms yeah, because mm. Western medicine is always about specialties. You either understand the brain or you understand right. the brain. Right, yes. Right? You, it, like, I, I'm a brain person and I never thought I would be talking about hormones or ovaries. And if I talk to my OBGYN colleagues, which I do daily at this point, they don't really know what 
to do with our brains. You know, they don't manage brain health. They don't manage brain. They don't know how to read a brain scan. But in reality, this is a, this is a system that, that works as a system and changes at the same time. And whatever happens to your ovaries has an impact in your brain. Lisa, this is why this discussion is so important and your book is so amazing. Um, so I've had a lot of health issues in my gut and I've been battling them for now probably over, over six years. And when it first started happening, I had gut issues, I couldn't eat, I hadn't had a period, um, I was always tired, always brain fog. And every time I would go to a doctor, if I went to, you know, the, the gut specialist, oh, I've got a tablet for that. But then over here, if I'd go to my, you know, gynecologist, it was something else. And I'm like, guys, there seems like there's a connection here, you know, and it's just like, but no one is like, they're like, oh, no one was talking to each other. And so I think it is so freaking important what you're saying, because I'm all about empowerment. How do I empower myself with knowledge so that I can approach any situation that I'm looking looking for with the knowledge and then I can adjust, right? So if it's, I want to feel extremely confident today, I know that my hormones have to do with it. And I know that by looking at the cycle or where I am in my cycle, I can determine whether this is a good time for me to step up and be confident, or actually it's a time to self-soothe and relax and take it more easy. And we don't talk enough about that because I know I've even heard you say, it's like a freaking superpower. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a superpower. I think if we were just educated and, and we had the information and the knowledge, we could really use it to our advantage. Because it's important, even just, just exactly what you were saying, what you said, like, no, how much coffee are you going to drink today? Does mm -hmm. it matter? Did, did you notice that there's, if you drink the same amount of coffee before ovulation and after ovulation, the effect is going to be completely different? Do you mind if we dive deep in that? Because that's the sort of the stuff. So thank you for bringing that up. So you've spoken about, um, so it, when it comes to optimization, there's diet, there's supplements, exercise, stress, and sleep. So I'd love to go deep on into those. Um, and then we definitely will talk about the pregnancy because that is so important that I definitely want to make sure that we touch there. Um, but you, so let's talk about diet for, for starters. I, I love talking about diet in part because it's a very powerful tool that we have because everybody eats every day, right? So we're all, as a society, we're, we're comfortable with the idea that we feed our bodies and that our diet will reflect into what kind of clothing we will, you, we will wear mm. or, you know, a certain body weight or body type. But the truth is that the same exact foods that change your body also really impact the functionality of the brain. So the way that we respond, that the body responds to stimulants changes throughout the cycle. Okay. In that when your estradiol levels are high, which is the week before ovulation and the few days afterwards, then the stimulants would really have a good positive effect. So if your estrogen is high, you have a lot of energy, you don't need as much coffee and you feel the effects more strongly. Okay. But in the second part of the cycle, you'll need three times more coffee to achieve the same level of alertness. Whoa! Oh, no, I mean, times? three times is, is, is ballpark. I just mean... Still, before. though, I mean, that's... A, yeah, <laughs> look, it's still a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's still a lot. I mean, you, you'll need more. You'll need more caffeine to have the same kind of response. And yeah. that's why many women will drink too much coffee and then you get the jitters so you don't feel so good mm -hmm. that you actually feel tired because you have exceeded your threshold. So I think this is important to, to keep in mind. And something I like to do personally during the second half of the cycle is that I switch to cacao tea. I love coffee. Oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm Italian. So my espresso <laughs> is important to me. But sometimes if I feel like tired and there's no reason for me to be tired, then I'd be like, oh, maybe, you know, it's a specific kind of moment of the month and maybe I want to switch to something more gentle actually just recently I was like why do I want the cacao so much and I think in part mm. is the is the fact that it gives you more energy for longer periods of time especially if you mix it mm. so caffeine and theobromine 
which is the antioxidant that's found in cacao powder, they're both vasodilating nutrients. Mm. So they improve blood flow to the brain. The difference is that the action, the half-life of caffeine is shorter. So the fat goes away a little bit faster and also it impacts heart rate. Whereas the theobromine in raw cacao has a gentler effect that is more sustained over time, a little bit like tea. If you drink black mm. tea, you don't get the rush of energy, but you'll be up at night <laughs> if you drink right. it. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So kind of like that. And also if you mix it with something that contains a little bit of fat, like either milk, if you drink milk or oat milk or you know, whatever you like that contains a bit of fat, that will slow down the release of the caffeine or the theobromine to the brain, giving you oh. more energy over time. Yeah, which is one Whoa. of the reasons that the bulletproof coffee works so well. So for women, we need to be a little bit more careful or just a little bit more aware, especially those who, who do have sensitivity to stimulants. The same goes for alcohol. Mm, mm. That's fascinating. Um, are there any foods? So you mentioned like antioxidants. So is it a better time to eat like more blueberries in your cycle? I actually, I was, well, yeah, I think you want to eat even more antioxidants and iron compound, you know, foods can contain iron and minerals is towards the end of your cycle as you prepare for menstruation. Oh well, yeah, but you know, it's very depleting. To, right. to have a menstrual cycle. So it's really important, I think, to replenish all the nutrients and and be sure to support your body because there's also an inflammatory component, right? And so the antioxidants, the double down as anti-inflammatory nutrients are very helpful in that respect. See, there's so much more to food than just food. Food is information, mm-hmm. and food is function. And, and one of the functionalities of food is that very specific nutrients can literally speak to our cells. So for example, omega-3 fatty acids, and everybody's aware that omega-3 fatty acids are good for you, they're good for your body, they're good for your brain, they're good for your heart, and mostly have anti-inflammatory capacities. And one way that they do so is that they literally speak to your DNA in your cells and tell them, and they would be like, okay, I'm here, you don't have to produce that many anti-inflammatory compound mm. because i'm in the circulation whereas if it's not present then your dna will know that it needs to make more anti-inflammatory enzymes to to balance it out so there's always a relationship between the foods that we eat and the way that their body needs to respond and either upgrade the production of certain things or downregulate it i find it fascinating and it's the same in the brain yeah, I find that fascinating too. And there's just something different though about the body. It speaks to you, you know, like, oh, my, my shoulder aches, right? And you're like, what did I do? And you like think about what you did. And, you know, it's so very specific in the moment. But like the brain, even just like reading your book and understanding what we're doing now has like 30 year effect, you know, effects on you 30 years later. Like that really becomes um very enlightening and to make sure that i'm trying to eat the right things right now so you've said about the diet during the cycle you mentioned omega-3 um would you suggest an omega-6 is that right or just three yeah so usually we recommend a balance between omega-3 and omega-6 um the point is that the western diet the typical western diet contains a ton of omega-6 fatty acids and very little of the omega-3s. So I think it's helpful to focus on foods that contain more omega-3s and trying to eat less of those that are very high in omega-6 compounds. You Mm. want a two to one ratio, whereas the typical Western diet is a 20 to one ratio in favor of the omega-6 or even higher than that because of all the oils and all the refined oils and Mm. all the peanuts and meat and whatnot. So fish is a good source of omega-3 fatty acids, fish, Mm -hmm. shellfish. Um, You don't have to necessarily eat fish. A lot of people don't like it. Some people don't want to eat it because of environmental concerns and whatnot. So there are plant-based sources of omega-3s that are really great. I had switched from my beloved extra virgin olive oil to flax oil. So one tablespoon of flax oil contains almost 
all the omega threes you need for wow. the form of ALA. So you actually should have a little bit more for your brain because ALAs are the plant based omega threes, but they need to be converted into DHA and EPA. And about seventy percent of the fat is lost in the conversion. So you actually have to eat more. So then you go for hemp seeds or um, flax seeds or chickpeas or legumes or something like that. Some nuts and seeds. And then back to the olive oil for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll do a bit of a blend. <laughs> um. So, okay, so that's fascinating. And so if you're unable to get it from natural foods, um, I assume supplements is the next best thing? Yes, I would say so. Uh, if you're concerned that your diet might be too low in these nutrients, then supplements are definitely recommended. What I would say is then supplements should not replace a healthy diet. Mm. And I find that sometimes people would much rather get the supplements than eat healthily. And that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So it's best to really focus on having a healthy diet and a diverse diet with all sorts of foods and nutrients and supplements as a backup. I would say that would be my backup plan. Lots of patients will come to us and say, give me something, you know, whether it's a supplement mm -hmm. or something. And so we're like, well, let, let's do some tests first and see if your levels are actually low because otherwise supplements don't work. They only work if they're supplementing, which means that you have to be low in the nutrients first in order for the supplement to have a benefit for you. So I think it's important to know yourself, know your numbers. I think in medicine, we're switching to a precision medicine approach where instead of treating the average person or to treat a person as a point in a regression line, you know, we actually want to understand the person in front of us and, and do all the tests that we can do and understand your physiology and then interact with your physiology in a way that, that is helpful to you. I think that's so that's important. <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing, especially, so I've been married to my husband now for almost 20 years. And, you know, when he's when he's taking you know, vitamin D and he's taking all these supplements and, it, you know, originally I was just copying whatever he was doing. So everything that you're talking about is being very um, catered to you, I think is so spot on. Um, so I love that. Um, but now let's talk about exercise because I heard you say, and it's so true where you have, let's say like the woman wants to like lose weight. Right. And so she's like changes her diet and she goes on like these sprints and does all these exercises and like loses half a pound. And then you've got the guy that just quits soda and doesn't change his exercise routine at all. And then ends up losing 20 pounds. So that obviously can be very frustrating, but I think it's actually important to discuss what is happening to a female, um, what exercises can we do that is good for our brains. Um, so yeah, if you can take us down now, that would be great. Mm -hmm. I think that is really important. Exercise is the same as diet. There is no one size that fits all and it's very personal. And it depends. It depends on what your goals are. If we're thinking about the brain, yeah. Then what's really important is not intensity as much as consistency. This is what the research on exercise and brain health shows. Then the key is really, obviously, if you, if you can go higher intensity and it's enjoyable to you and you can do it, good, absolutely. Nobody's going to stop you, believe me. But the problem, especially in the United States, is that people don't exercise that much to start with. And especially for women, there's a very sharp decline in the amount of time that is devoted to exercise or even just moving, just being physically active as soon as we're past college, right? Because of whatever reasons in societies and demands and growing a family and just holding a job and whatnot, women just don't make as much time for exercise as they do for other things. What is important is to make exercise a routine part of your wellness plan, right? So to speak, and it's very hard to do that. It's honestly very hard, but what the brain wants at the minimum, it's a moderate intensity exercise. And the need for frequency ranges between three and five times a week. And most experts recommend at least 45 minutes 
a moderate intensity exercise three to five times a week. If you can do five, it's better than three. If you can do three, it's better than none. Yeah. So I think it's also important to be gentle with yourself and really understand whether or not a specific routine fits into your everyday life and make it sustainable. Women who are physically active after the age of 35 have a 30% lower risk of dementia in old age than women who are sedentary. And 30% is insane. 30%, one in three. So that is very important. If we had drugs that lowered your risk of dementia in old age by 30%, it would be FDA approved tomorrow and everybody would take it, right? Instead, we don't have it. <laughs> we don't have that drug, but we can exercise. So we always recommend this to our patient, just find the exercise routine that works for you, that you like, you need to have your, you need to get your heart beating faster. That, that is key. You know, yes, mm -hmm. walking is lovely, but then walk faster. You have to challenge your cardiovascular system so that the brain can experience an increase in blood flow, more oxygen, more nutrients, more resilience, because the brain contains a huge amount of veins. Basically, you know, the, the vasculature of the brain is incredible. You need to support it. And, and you do it by keeping your heart strong in your entire system strong. So brisk walk five times a week, three times a week. Great. If you can do something more. A clinical trials of exercise has shown that some parts of your brain can actually regrow. Oh my God. Yeah. Like the memory center of the brain, the hippocampus actually did not show any decline mm -hmm. in people who were walking fast. These were elderly people who were just walking fast very often, like throughout the week. And actually in some cases show, show the bit of a, a rebound. I mean, that's so beautiful, like valuable information. So I am always looking at how do I show up tomorrow morning, right? How do I show up today in the best way that I possibly can? Um, if I have to look at my hormones and amazing, if I have to look at like, what are the things that I need to look at in order to protect my brain so that I can show up, being able to make business decisions, being able to be um, emotionally like sober, I like to call it, so that I can have um, maybe some conflicts in the day that it doesn't spill me over emotionally. Like how do I show up to be strong and confident? Like everything we're talking about um, is about the now, but then also what are the things that I can do for to help my the future Lisa in me that's going to get there right like the hope is that I do live long enough to be 95 years old so what are the, you know what are the things so exercise is fantastic diet supplement let's talk about stress stress is we all know that you know especially now these days stress isn't good for you it gets you know it's actually causing you know early heart attacks and strokes and things like that but I've actually heard you say that stress is actually harder on females than it is on males can you talk to me about that because that was fascinating yes yeah, so, uh, what happens in reality is that stress works in balance with our sex hormones so the way that the body reacts to stress is by increasing the production of a hormone called cortisol, which is the main stress hormone. And the way that the brain is, the body and the brain is able to do that is by sinking or reducing the production of your sex hormones because they, they all come from the same precursor. For your brain and your body to be able to increase the production of cortisol, that means suppressing the production of sex hormones like estradiol and progesterone. Mm. When that happens, as a woman, you don't feel great because your brain is literally wired to be activated in part by the estrogen, especially the estrogen, but also the progesterone, because estrogen is an activator for the brain. It's a neuroprotective hormone that has a very boosting effect on brain energy levels. So when your cortisol goes up, your estradiol goes down and your brain suffers. And then new studies with brain scans that, that use brain scans to look at this relationship has shown that chronic stress, so not just acute, occasional mm. stress, but chronic stress, increases cortisol levels in a way this is quite persistent and that really has deleterious effect on memory performance already in midlife so starting at age 35 
especially in women, and that gets worse after women go through menopause, because then the high cortisol actually correlates with brain shrinkage only in women. Wow. Yes, that is bad news. That is very bad news because I don't know any woman who's not under stress, most Mm -hmm. likely chronic stress. Like you turn 35 and you're stressed out and that is unlikely to get better (laughs) unless you really put an effort and come up with strategies to reduce stress. So reducing stress doesn't just save your day. It also really saves your brain for the long term. So I think it's really important for all of us to just take a collective (gasps) sigh, you know, and just acknowledge the fact that we're all under stress and that we need to, we really need to prioritize reducing stress is a very important brain protective strategy. And we, I think we're all aware that well-being is a skill, right? We, we know that cultivating well-being is really a skill and is, a, is very much an urgent public health need, but we're not given the tools to do that. Yeah. Like we, we have a, a million different tools to take care of our hair, to take care of our skin. <laughs> so true. Right, for our bodies to look a certain way, you go to the gym, there all, there's all sorts of contraptions available. But very little has been done for people to really have the tools to cultivate mental health and well-being. And we live in a, in a society that consistently prioritizes productivity and just soldering on and, and, and just toughening up instead of de-stressing and taking time for yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think especially as women, we need to do that because a woman has no time for herself. And men could say, well, we don't have either. Yeah, but, but women have less, right? And it just starts as soon as you leave school and you find the job that you're literally sandwiched between responsibilities. And there's mm-hmm. so many expectations saying you have to work so hard just to keep your role in society and just to keep your job. You have to fight for equal rights and equal pay and you're under stress. So we need to find solutions against stress. I, I really strongly yeah. believe that. I'm not good at it, by the way. <laughs> so that's the thing. Okay, so let's say everything you're saying, right, completely agree with. You agree with too. But we both know we're not great at it. So what are the things, because everyone listening, I'm sure, is thinking the same, right? It's like, oh, my God, I get it. Yes, it's really detrimental. Way worse than I think we ever thought it was. Um, and so now it's like, but how do we actually monitor that and live a life right where we live a life where we can get on with our lives that we're not you know like for instance running a business and doing a show like women of impact it's freaking stressful but i love it right but it's 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 filling my heart it's my mission it's my purpose so i go i'm not going to stop it but i recognize that stress is very detrimental to my health and how i show up and how i'm going to be at 90 years old so what are the things that we can do just to keep an eye on that doesn't become an entire life change? Because I wish it could be everyone could do life changes. We all magically change the way that we live and we're all good. And now we're managing our stress. We all know that's not a reality. So what are the things in reality, knowing all the things you have to go through, knowing all the things I have to go through that we can do maybe on a day to day basis that can help alleviate that so that we don't blink and in five, 10 years, we're a big ball of stress and we can't unwind it. Yeah, and we have no brains left. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think the best answers are exercise, sleep, meditation. These are really the most effective things that one can do. Diet is also effective, I think, but exercise is a must. Exercise boosts your endorphins, reduces inflammation, and blunts your response to stress. It makes you better at responding to stress. So exercise is a big deal. I think actually in that case, yoga or that kind of mind-body techniques Mm. would also be really helpful if it's your thing. For me, it really helps. I, I, I have a hard time sitting still, and I had to sit a lot. So when, when I'm able to move, I'd rather do something fast, like running or I actually invested in a small elliptical machine that can keep 
literally next door. So whenever I'm in a meeting that I don't have to have video on for, I'll just be <laughs> on the elliptical or going for walks if you can. Being in nature, actually, being in nature has been shown to have wonderful effects on, mm. on stress levels. My daughter is very outdoorsy. Mm. And so weekends, we try to go for walks and we have a little forest nearby that she yeah. likes to go. That is very nice. And another thing is really meditation. And I, I do encourage meditation for kids as mm. well. Like my daughter meditates with me at night. We have these little meditations for children as an app that I really like. That she loves and little stories. But that really has changed my life. So, as you know, I would just recommend Jack Cornfield. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yeah. It's yeah. Really fantastic. And meditations for beginners, they're guided meditations. And just his voice is just so soothing and so real. Like he really walks his talk mm-hmm. that I really enjoy that. And then he wrote books and, you know, there are other people who, who do this kind of work and it's very, very helpful. And meditation is like exercise. You need to find the kind of meditation that really works for you. Yeah. So for me, it's insight meditation or mindfulness meditation. But there are so many other options and there are people who like to do that with apps i personally don't except for my child but there are a ton of apps that can really help it's the same as sleep you know sleep kind of got the bad rap in the sense of like oh well that's the thing you can skip that's the thing you don't have to focus on um talk to me about actually this the impact of sleep on our brains Mm -hmm. and sleep is really like one of the last frontiers in a way because we we now Mm -hmm. understand the importance of sleep for brain health There are many different things that happen during sleep. One that is very important is that the brain is able to reduce inflammation when we're sleeping. And the other one is that it's really, it's literally the only chance that the brain has to take care of itself. So sleep is me time for the brain. And sleep goes in cycles, right? There are different phases of sleep that start with you know, when you're just falling asleep, there's sleepiness, you start having dreams, but then you go through a phase where you have no dreams, so your body's completely still. And that is the slow wave sleep phase or the deep sleep phase that is followed by REM sleep when we have dreams. But that phase when we're completely still and the brain is not dreaming is actually the crucial component of sleep in terms of health and well-being, because that is really when the brain activates. It's like the brain is your mom and says, okay, the kids are are down for the night. I can take a shower. I just can take care of myself. And literally the brain is like, oh, everybody's quiet. The house is quiet. I'm going to turn on this new system, the glymphatic system, that is like a dishwasher. This literally jets of water or fluid that open up in the brain and remove, it's like power wash your brain so that all the toxins, all the impurities, all the waste products, even Alzheimer's plaques are removed then. Because wow. when we're awake and we're moving, we're doing stuff, there are these, these um, microglial cells in the brain that just pick up all these bits and pieces that need to be getting rid of. And if you're not getting that phase of your sleep, then you're going to miss out on a huge opportunity for the brain to really heal itself. That's amazing. Have you noticed then a correlation between um, a cognitive decline and people getting less and less rest? Yes. Yes, actually, there's a, there's a there's strong evidence that sleep deprivation or even just fragmented sleep when you keep waking up multiple times mm-hmm. at night is associated with the development of Alzheimer's disease in the brain right in, in the 50s. And it's not just Alzheimer's disease, there's also inflammation. There's, there's mm. Basically, I think that when it comes to lifestyle, I think what we're understanding is that if you don't have a healthy lifestyle, you're enabling all your risks to become actual medical issues. In a way, whereas if you have a strong, healthy lifestyle, you're effectively reducing this, this risk and keeping the risks under control almost on a daily basis. So it's a preventative in that respect that you're really avoiding issues and you're keeping your genes at bay in a way. I love that. Okay, I'm going to ask you a really hard question right now. It may be easy for you though, I don't know. 
Um, so I live my health issues, but I have lived a very healthy lifestyle. Um, with the health issues, I've definitely changed my life. I've changed the way that I eat. I changed my lifestyle, like everything, the way I sleep, everything. But I've chosen to not have children. And I've heard you say in your book, where you break down, so, we, you know, going back to the subject we were saying earlier about how pregnancy, like these, the three Ps, right? The, the puberty and the pregnancy. And at the pregnancy, um, whether you've had a baby or whether you've gone through those hormonal changes or not actually has an effect on your future brain and Alzheimer's and things like that. So I literally, as I was reading your book, I was like, I really wanted to know the answer. And you can be very honest with me. But was is not having children a possible... Um, detriment to my brain health as I age? No. Our research and other people's research have shown that women who have children have a little bit more protection against Alzheimer's disease as compared to women who don't have children and women have, who have more than five. But it's not universal. What I, what I want to clarify, sure. this is observational. This is just of a correlation. You know, it's not that you need to have a kid tomorrow. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, is, there are challenges, you know, I haven't, I totally get it that, that you'd rather not. But what is happening then in your brain that, that, that makes a difference? I think it increases plasticity. Having children, so what the research shows is that as women go through pregnancy and especially postpartum, that's really when your brain changes the most in your entire life in the fastest mm -hmm. and it changes in ways that are very complicated and we're just starting to really understand but just so far what we know is that your brain shrinks when you're pregnant and perhaps shrinks even more right after the baby is born but in a way that is very similar to puberty so it's considered an optimization in that I like to talk about pregnancy as, as, a, as a system upgrade, as if the brain is a computer and you had an upgrade during puberty, mm -hmm. and now you're having another upgrade during pregnancy because once your baby is born, that's it. You know, if you were the most important person in the room, you can forget about it. Now, <laughs> everything, you basically your job as mother nature intended it, is to make sure that human being survives. Right. And that means that a lot of connections in your brain are going to have to be rewired to stimulate your maternal instincts and stimulate your ability to really respond mm. to the requests of a creature who can't speak or can't move for a long time. <laughs> and so what people say is that what scientists have shown is that you basically do lose connections in some parts of the brain Mm. You lose neurons, but your connectivity gets stronger in certain parts of the brain that are preparing you for motherhood. So your brain is going through a rewiring and a remodeling mm -hmm. that seems to be helpful in that plasticity is stimulated. So your brain becomes more plastic and that seems to give an advantage for the long term as well. Now, if you don't get pregnant, your brain is fine. You know, actually right. you're avoiding this, this turmoil that needs to happen. So I think this is just one factor that is so specifically unique to women. Obviously, men can't have children. Mm -hmm. So this is a mechanism, it's a biological mechanism that has evolved to support motherhood. And the vast majority of people see that as being adaptive, even though you have the mommy brain, even though you have brain fog, even though like I found myself literally knocking on the door of the fridge before opening the fridge. <laughs> I'm very polite, you know, I would just open the door. So it's just knocking and waiting and waiting. And then my husband's like, hmm. So that's the thing though, I, but that's what I process, right? Is that... I'm not going to have a child just so that I can create brain plasticity, but I do look, I do look at this stuff and I actually, I don't think that that's a bad thing. Like if you were like, yes, Lisa, you know, they do have the edge, which you said, right? They do have the edge. So then I go to, 
Now, how do I create brain plasticity myself without having a child? Because I just go to, if they're facts, there are facts. And now just being aware of it allows me to think outside the box. So for instance, with someone like, is there something that I can do, like a test or anything that I could do to help me gain um, brain plasticity without actually having to have a child? <laughs> Having having kids is just one factor. There, there's a million factors. Women who develop or go through puberty earlier on in life and go through menopause later in life, so those with the longest reproductive span, they also have an edge, right? They, mm. Their brains also have more plasticity because you've had more of these hormones in your body for a longer period of time. So that's that's another factor. Yeah. Or whether or not you took hormones throughout your life, whether or not you took like birth control, or whether or not you're going to have to take estradiol for symptoms of menopause. Those also are factors then that are just as important. Uh, your diet is important. Your fitness is important. How much sleep you get per night is important. Your happiness is important. Your positive outlook on life is important. You don't have to have children to protect your brain. It's just one component to brain health. And the reason we were looking into it is it's because we're interested in hormones and how hormones impact the brain. Yeah, like I said, I wouldn't have a baby for that reason, but it's I just, I, I'm, I'm such a person that like, I wanna have the knowledge no matter what that means. So when I heard your you say about um, the benefits of brain plastic, plasticity when you have kids, the first thing that came to mind was, oh, am I, am I now, a step behind and I don't mind that if I am it's kind of like I just want to know the truth so that I can then plan for like all right what else can I do um to mitigate this so all right I I don't think you you should worry at all these studies are descriptive and I, I think they're, they're important because hopefully they will stimulate more research right right Probably because there's very little research done on pregnancy and the long-term effects of pregnancy on the brain all we know is what happens basically when you're pregnant and like within two oh, years. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Baby, there's very little work done to associate that with anything else later in life. So I think it's just the process of a better understanding our brains and how to keep them healthy. And I, I think lifestyle is incredibly important. Mm. We see that at the clinic all the time that when people really comply <laughs> with the guidelines and recommendations that they're given, their memory improves, their attention improves, their overall health really improves. And for some women, taking hormones may be helpful. Mm -hmm. So there are many different strategies. And I think that the approach should be individualized. Click here right now, guys, if you want to learn how to stop stress, anxiety, and all the negative emotions that you may be feeling right now. I, I think this is so important because there's a lot of messages out there let's be happy. Mm. Let me show you how to just be happy all the time.